Part Four, A Voyage to the Country of the Huenims, Chapter Twelve, The Author's Veracity, His Design in Publishing This Work, His Censure of Those Travellers Who Swear from the Truth. The author clears himself from any sinister ends in writing. An objection answered. The method of planting colonies. His native country commended. The right of the crown to those countries described by the author is justified. The difficulty of conquering them. The author takes his last leave of the reader. Proposes his manner of living for the future. Gives good advice. And concludes... Thus, gentle reader, I have given thee a faithful history of my travels for sixteen years and above seven months, wherein I have not been so studious of ornament as of truth. I could, perhaps, like others, have astonished thee with strange and probable tales, but I rather chose to relate plain matter of fact in the simplest manner and style, because my principal design was to inform and not to amuse thee. It is easy for us who travel into remote countries, which are seldom visited by Englishmen or other Europeans, to form descriptions of wonderful animals both at sea and land. Whereas a traveller's chief aim should be to make men wiser and better, and to improve their minds by the bad as well as good example of what they deliver concerning foreign places. I could heartily wish a law was enacted that every traveller, before he were permitted to publish his voyages, should be obliged to make oath before the Lord High Chancellor that all he intended to print was absolute truth to the best of his knowledge. For then the world would no longer be deceived, as it usually is, while some writers, to make their works pass the better upon the public, impose the grossest falsities on the unwary reader. I have perused several books of travel with great delight in my younger days but having since gone over most parts of the globe, and been able to contradict many fabulous accounts from my own observation, it has given me a great disgust against this part of reading, and some indignation to see the credulity of mankind so impudently abused. Therefore, since my acquaintance were pleased to think my poor endeavours might not be unacceptable to my country, I imposed on myself, as a maxim never to be swerved from, that I would strictly adhere to truth. Neither, indeed, can I be ever under the least temptation to vary from it, while I retain in my mind the lectures and examples of my most noble master and the other illustrious Winhams, of whom I had so long the honour to be their humble hearer. Nec si miserum fortuna synonym finixit, vanum etiam menda chemque improba finget. I know very well how little reputation is to be got by writings which require neither genius nor learning, nor indeed any other talent except a good memory or an exact journal. I know likewise that writers of travels, like dictionary makers, are sunk into oblivion by the weight and bulk of those who came last, and therefore lie uppermost. And it is highly probable that such travellers, who shall hereafter visit the countries described in this work of mine, may, by detecting my errors, if there be any, and adding many new discoveries of their own, jostle me out of vogue, and stand in my place, making the world forget that ever I was an author. This, indeed, would be too great a mortification, if I wrote for fame. But my sole intention was the public good. I cannot be altogether disappointed. For who can read of the virtues I have mentioned in the glorious Winhams, without being ashamed of his own vices, when he considers himself as the reasoning, governing animal of his country? I shall say nothing of those remote nations where yahoos preside, among which the least corrupted are the Brobding Nangians, whose wise maxims in morality and government it would be our happiness to observe. But I forbear discanting further, and rather leave the judicious reader to his own remarks and application. I am not a little pleased that this work of mine can possibly meet with no censures. For what objections can be made against a writer who relates only plain facts that happened in such distant countries, 
where we have not the least interest with respect either to trade or negotiations. I have carefully avoided every fault with which common writers of travels are often too justly charged. Besides, I meddle not the least with any party, but write without passion, prejudice, or ill-will against any man, or number of men whatsoever. I write for the noblest end, to inform and instruct mankind, over whom I may, without breach of modesty, pretend to some superiority, from the advantages I received from conversing so long among the most accomplished Winhams. I write without any view to profit or praise. I never suffer a word to pass that may look like reflection, or possibly give the least offence, even to those who are most ready to take it. So that I hope I may, with justice, pronounce myself an author perfectly blameless, against whom the tribes of answerers, considerers, observers, reflectors, detectors, remarkers, will never be able to find matter for exercising their talents. I confess it was whispered to me that I was bound in duty, as a subject of England, to have given a memorial to a secretary of state at my first coming over, because whatever lands are discovered by a subject belong to the crown. But I doubt whether our conquests in the countries I treat of would be as easy as those of Ferdinando Cortez over the naked Americans. The Lilliputians, I think, are hardly worth the charge of a fleet and army to reduce them, and I question whether it might be prudent or safe to attempt the Brobdingnagians, or whether an English army would be much at their ease with the flying island over their heads. The Huynhams, indeed, appear not to be so well prepared for war, a science to which they are perfect strangers, and especially against missive weapons. However, supposing myself to be a minister of state, I could never give my advice for invading them. Their prudence, unanimity, unacquaintedness with fear, and their love for their country, would amply supply all defects in the military art. Imagine twenty thousand of them breaking into the midst of a European army, confounding the ranks, overturning the carriages, battering the warriors' faces into mummy by terrible yerks from their hinder foots. For they would well deserve the character given to Augustus, the calcitrat underque tutus. But, instead of proposals for conquering that magnanimous nation, I rather wish they were in a capacity, or disposition, to send a sufficient number of their inhabitants for civilizing Europe, by teaching us the first principles of honour, justice, truth, temperance, public spirit, fortitude, chastity, friendship, benevolence, and fidelity. The names of all which virtues are still retained among us in most languages, and are to be met with in modern as well as ancient authors, which I am able to assert from my own small reading. But I had another reason which made me less forward to enlarge His Majesty's dominions by my discoveries. To say the truth, I had conceived a few scruples with relation to the distributive justice of princes upon those occasions. For instance, a crew of pirates are driven by a storm they know not whither. At length the boy discovers land from the topmast. They go on shore to rob and plunder. They see a harmless people, are entertained with kindness. They give the country a new name. They take formal possession of it for their king. They set up a rotten plank or a stone for a memorial. They murder two or three dozen of the natives. Bring away a couple more by force for a sample. Return home and get their pardon. Here commences a new dominion acquired with a title by divine right. Ships are sent with the first opportunity. The natives driven out or destroyed. Their princes tortured to discover their gold. A free license given to all acts of inhumanity and lust. The earth reeking with the blood of its inhabitants. And this excretable crew of butchers, employed in so pious an expedition, is a modern colony, sent to convert and civilize an idolatrous and barbarous people. But this description, I confess, does by no means affect the British nation, who may be an example to the whole world for their wisdom, care, and justice in planting colonies. Their liberal endowments for the advancement of religion and learning, 
their choice of devout and able pastors to propagate Christianity, their caution in stocking their provinces with people of sober lives and conversations, from this the mother kingdom, their strict regard to the distribution of justice, and supplying the civil administration through all their colonies, with officers of the greatest abilities, utter strangers to corruption, and, to crown it all, by sending the most vigilant and virtuous governors, who have no other views than the happiness of the people over whom they preside, and the honour of the king their master. But as those countries which I have described do not appear to have any desire of being conquered and enslaved, murdered or driven out by colonies, nor abound either in gold, silver, sugar, or tobacco, I did humbly conceive they were by no means proper objects of our zeal, our valour, or our interest. However, if those whom it more concerns think fit to be of another opinion, I am ready to dispose, when I shall be lawfully called, that no European did ever visit those countries before me. I mean, if the inhabitants ought to be believed, unless a dispute may arise concerning the two Yahoos, said to have been seen many years ago upon a mountain Whinhamland. But as to the formality of taking possession of my sovereign's name, it never once came into my thoughts, and if it had, yet as my affairs then stood, I should perhaps, in point of prudence and self-preservation, have put it off to a better opportunity. Having thus answered the only objection that can ever be raised against me as a traveller, I here take a final leave of all my courteous readers, and return to enjoy my own speculations in my little garden at Redriff, to apply those excellent lessons of virtue which I learned among the Huynhams, to instruct the Yahoos of my own family, as far as I shall find them docible animals, to behold my figure often in a glass, and thus, if possible, habituate myself by time to tolerate the sight of a human creature, to lament the brutality to Huynhams in my own country, but always treat their persons with respect, for the sake of my noble master, his family, his friends, and the whole Huynham race, whom these of ours have the honour to resemble in all their lineaments, however their intellectuals come to degenerate. I began last week to permit my wife to sit at dinner with me, at the farthest end of a long table, and to answer, but with the utmost brevity, the few questions I asked her. Yet the smell of a yahoo continuing very offensive, I always keep my nose well stopped with rue, lavender, or tobacco leaves. And, although it be hard for a man late in life to remove old habits, I am not altogether out of hopes, in some time, to suffer a neighbour yahoo in my company, without the apprehensions I am yet under of his teeth or his claws. My reconcilement to the Yahoo kind in general might not be so difficult, if they would be content with those vices and follies only which nature has entitled them to. I am not in the least provoked at the sight of a lawyer, a pickpocket, a colonel, a fool, a lord, a gamester, a politician, a whoremonger, a physician, an evidence, a suborn, an attorney, a traitor, or the like. This is all according to the due course of things. But when I behold a lump of deformity and disease, both in body and mind, smitten with pride, it immediately breaks all the measure of my patience. Neither shall I ever be able to comprehend how such an animal and such a vice could tally together. The wise and virtuous Huynhams, who are bound in all excellences that can adorn a rational creature, have no name for this vice in their language, which has no terms to express anything that is evil, except those whereby they describe the detestable qualities of their yahoos, among which they were not able to distinguish this of pride, for want of thoroughly understanding human nature, as it shows itself in other countries where that animal presides. But I, who had more experience, could plainly observe some rudiments of it among the wild yahoos. But the Huynhams who live under the government of reason are no more proud of the good qualities they possess than I should be for not wanting a leg or an arm, which no man in his wits would boast of, although he must be miserable without them. 
I dwell the longer upon this subject from the desire I have to make the society of an English Yahoo by any means not insupportable. And therefore I here entreat that those who have any tincture of this absurd vice, that they will not presume to come in my sight. End of part four, chapter twelve. End of Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift.